So my name is Tanya McHenry. Um, I was actually born in Washington. My mom's family um, has been in the valley since for a very long time. And my dad, he's, he's my, technically my stepfather, but, um, but that's just biological. He's been my dad since I was seven years old. Um, he was a truck driver. And at some point he was spending more time down here than he was at home and we wound up moving here when I was basically a sophomore in high school. I started sophomore in Ashland. Um, and one of the first things I remember coming to the valley after we kind of lived in a, a little mobile, like a trailer in my, my great aunt's house in Talent, um, was when we were looking for houses. And Ashland was described as this really diverse, great place to be. And we were supposed to avoid Gold Hill because the KKK existed there. <laughs> <laughs> this was not something I actually really knew about. I mean, the KKK is something you barely cover in history, but the idea that it was here it was probably one of the first eye-opening things. Um, because it just, we came from the suburbs, like on the outside of Tacoma, Puyallup, that area, and it just wasn't something that ever came up. We did wind up moving to Ashland. It was outside the city limits, but Valley View. And then we started going to Ashland High School as a sophomore. Me, this is me and my twin, uh, Trina McHenry. And that's kind of our introductory to the Rogue Valley. At some point we had visited here when we were younger. I don't actually really remember that because I think we saw great grandparents or something, but I have almost no memories of that visit. So that technically wasn't the first time we came to the Rogue Valley, but moving here is the first time I have strong memories of it. Um, Ashland High School is not diverse, it was not diverse. So somehow early on, I realized that when people say Ashland is diverse, they're talking about like lifestyles and different cultures. But going there, I know it was not diverse. We were like, I don't even know if there were other black children or biracial children. I know there's a couple, but they weren't black um, there. So it's, I wouldn't say it was, it was odd <laughs> because you get this impression because everyone's always talking about how, how diverse Ashland is, but it, it never really was that. Um, and I don't think it really is today. I think that it's still being described as that, but I like to kind of laugh and say I can, I can kind of make fun of Ashland because I grew up there. <laughs> I'm not an outsider. I mean, I, I, high school, I went there. Um, I was, I was a senior class that didn't have a cafeteria because they tore down the building. Um, we were there during the flood because um, we were outside the city limits. We never really lost water, but you couldn't drink it. I mean, there's just these experiences until this year. Uh, the biscuit fire would have been the big fire that everybody talked about. But I mean, it's just these, um, these experiences. Uh, but Ashland did have a good music program. That's kind of where my social aspect came from. Um, I love band. I was in jazz band. Um, wasn't great with music in terms of, like I never really wanted to make that a career, but I, I did get a couple awards there because I, I was good at it, but it was never like a, like I didn't pursue it in college because that competition didn't interest me. This fight to get first chair, second chair, to um, the, the large amount of studies that would take to actually turn that into a career or, or a lifelong um, pursuit. I just love playing it. It was one of my most favorite memories are coming from um, performing at Ashland. And I always thought it was hilarious that we had a marching band, but we didn't really have the uniforms like Phoenix did or Bedford. We just kind of ran, went around in like cover buns and like, <laughs> it was just, and even the 4th of July parade, we wore tie-dye shirts and <laughs> stuff, which was out of, out of the school season, but I did it at least once, because why not? But it was hot. And when we go to Klamath Falls and it gets so cold, the, the, the heads of the drums would just burst, so you're, you're not even getting a beat. 
by halfway through, but I played a trombone so I could at least wear mittens because you don't really need, you know, fingers to, to play a trombone, but <laughs> going to Klamath was, was always interesting. Um, some of the other early memories I have from Ashland though, especially when it comes to like um, feminism is actually surrounded around 90210, the show which was really big when I was a kid. We were allowed to watch 90210. Melrose Place was an absolute stop, which came on like right after it or something because it was just too racy. Um, the, and one of the reasons that has such a strong memory is there's this episode where they're talking, I think they're talking about condoms. And there's this, at some point, I think it was the care of, is it Donna? I can't remember her name, but she starts talking about if you have a swimming pool in the backyard, whether or not you should teach the kids to swim, even if you don't want them to, because there's always that risk. And this is something that came up at Ashland a few times, because I remember like they were freaking out because the nurses, I don't know if they were providing, if she was providing condoms or talking about them or something, whatever it was, I didn't want it on public school grounds. So my memory is that a group set up across the street, the parking lot, and just handed them out there. And, is, and I mean, Mountain Street, I, I don't know who actually owned the parking lot back then, but it sounded like anytime there was some sort of protest or whatever, that that was not considered school grounds or something. I'm not sure why they were allowed to do it across the parking lot, but I, I remember that there was more than one time where somebody would just stand across the schools right at the parking lot on like a sidewalk or something and do things, because that was considered like public. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, and the, and the other memory I had was there's something going on with daycare. Um, they had this, they being adults, parents, I didn't really kind of separate them at the time. I mean, parents were adults, vice versa. This real strange fear that if you made it easy for a teenage girl to get through high school, that the rest of us would just run out and get pregnant, which was just crazy because that's not really how that works, but they, at some point I feel like someone was trying to get a daycare there so that the girls that did have babies could finish school. And this was, this was a big controversy at the time. I don't actually remember where my parents fell on this. I have a feeling though where they fell then might actually be different today. Um, they seem a little bit like different people to me, but some of that has to do with how I perceive them. But, um, yeah, <laughs> I, I do remember that coming up. And I and also remember we had a friend, Kimmy, she's still in the area. We were trying to put together a diversity club. Um, I believe Kimmy is she's Mexican and she might also be Native American. I don't think I knew that until recently because it just didn't come up. Um, we had no staff member who was a minority back in there. There was one part-time art teacher that we tried to get involved with and she did try to help but we didn't really know what we were doing um there they had no i mean this hugely diverse city had like one minority staff member who was a part-time art teacher um and as much as ashton likes to say that they really love the arts and the music you look at how they support football and cheerleaders and the fact that we had to pay for our own music part way through. They like having band and art, but it was never supported to the degree that the sports and the cheerleaders were. They went to Japan, they got new uniforms. Band didn't even have uniforms. Um, we had jazz band, we had, I think we had, definitely had choir because we went to Disneyland with the choir, I think at once. And maybe the orchestra? I think there might have been an orchestra then. <laughs> but again, we were outside the city limits. I remember we rented my trombone for years. And when I went off to college, all I had was the mouthpiece because I needed a different mouthpiece for jazz in order to get the higher notes. Um, couldn't afford the actual trombone itself. And they had to pay, I don't know, something because we weren't in the city limits, they had to pay this extra fee in order for us to do extracurricular activities. And I know in the end that was a bit of a struggle. We didn't go to Disneyland the last time the band went because there was just no money for it. Um, and I remember telling them, you know, not to worry about it. We'd been there a couple times already. 
but <laughs> that was just that was just a thing. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of concerns now, like like the bullying that I hear about. Okay, so that was not a thing in school. I mean, bullying was, but there was no way for bullies to like chase me down on my cell phone into my house. I think we had maybe one or two people in my class that ever had a cell phone and they were the wealthiest kids in the school. So I grew up, I mean, they kind of call us, I like to call us the Oregon Trail Babies. Um, I think the other one is like, uh, maybe it's an Xennial. Uh, we're this group where we grew up without certain things. Like we didn't have cell phones in school. We did do the online cat screeching modem thing, but we're not, I mean, sometimes I'm classified as Gen X, but I'm really not. I didn't have the, the dot com boom was happening when I was like in school. So I wasn't in the workplace. I wasn't really buying from it. I wasn't part of creating it. And then you have the millennials, which I do have a lot more in common with, but I remember when there were not cell phones. Um, it's just this kind of like why I remember when we had like these huge, I don't know, 50 foot telephone cords. <laughs> I mean, that was mostly like the 80s, but I do have some memories of that. And also the laser disc kind of thing with the VHS. And my parents were whining about like, I think eight track tapes were not a thing or going out. Like I have these memories. I didn't use an eight track tape, but I remember the fights about it or arguments or something. <laughs> And those weirdo like car truck things they had, like the front part was like a car, but the back had this like little tiny truck thing that you don't really see anymore. <laughs> I mean, I guess they're on the right idea because hatchbacks kind of do the same thing, but don't look as weird. But so as an Oregon Trail baby, I have these memories where the tech was coming in and I had used both, the one before it and the one after it. Um, kind of lost track where I was going with that. Oh, the internet, yes. <laughs> so I was around when, AOL was like $3.95 an hour and one of my earliest video games online was a, was a game called Neverwinter Nights. It was a, at the time it would have been one of the first massive multiplayer online games and AOL you got it for free going through AOL but you were paying by the hour um, and that's probably I mean I had a lot of experience with like Nintendo the original NES and, and arcades and some of the earlier com computer games like Crandy in them, but Never One a Nice was the first time that you got on and played with other people and it was pretty pretty amazing and it sucked up a lot of my allowance because if you could think about three ninety five an hour <laughs> and how just a few hours a day you were suddenly just paying this extreme amount and then I think it was Prodigy was it Prodigy? No, no, maybe that was Project. I'm probably confusing. One of them went to a monthly fee, and all of a sudden you could just do as much as you can. You just pay this monthly fee, and the worst thing is you just get disconnected all the time. Linked dead <laughs> um, is what they would call it later in like the EverQuest days or stuff. So being part of the gaming group was always an early thing I was interested in. Always. There's just something about video games that were just incredible and I was playing board games at the same time too just just the, the earlier stuff like Monopoly, Chutes and Ladders, Candyland I mean I had always been interested in board games um, my access to an online community and other gamers probably hit electronic a little bit first but board games were never far behind my, my, my gaming group so we also did Dungeons and Dragons in high school and I was the dungeon master and what's interesting about that is my gaming group was mostly women. We usually, we, cause those are my friends. And then we had a couple of guys, brothers, friends too, that would, but almost always my gaming groups have always been dominated by women. And one of the biggest frustrations that we've had with that, board games, video games, pretty much any of them except the, on, the big massive online, is all of, even today, in a four or five player game, there's going to be one female character. Um, so I just, I just kind of learned to let one of the other girls take her and pick some other character, but it's almost impossible to get it. When they have distinct characters, we're still down, it's always, gonna, it's always like an elf with a bow. 
it's a female character with a bow she might be an owl she might be human like it's just even today it's you don't see like they're, they're making a new version of hero quest which is um which is a game that i grew up with uh, it's an online, or it's not online, but it's a it's a board game with, with four characters. You go around and and you beat a dungeon, get gold, get equipment. Um, they are all men in the original version, um, even the elf. And we just kind of played because that that's what you had. And there's a new version coming out, um, one of those kind of Kickstarter light game, and they turn the elf into a woman, which I think zero people are surprised they did that. And then they added the extra models as kind of like extra as part of the Kickstarter so that you can actually have all guys or all girls, but the girls are like the extra. So it's like, why can't they just include them with the original one? Because, I mean, even when there's a, a lady option, I don't always pick her. Um, I got used to not doing that, but it's, it's, not, it's just nice to have the option. Um, there's always a struggle, athletic, Agile, bow, elf, like it's almost, you almost never see the barbarian woman, the one that's strong, the one that's the warrior. They're just going to pick the sorcerer or the elf and then make that a woman. It's just the ponytail thing, like how many of them have to have ponytails? There's usually always an excuse though, well the extra characters will cost more money. The ponytails are easier to do because of hair. Um, as a woman and as a biracial woman and someone who's part of the black community, seeing someone with my kind of hair almost never happens. Even if they're black, they're not going to have my kind of hair. Um, and I don't think people understand why that matters. Because there's an entire movie that I think is Chris Rock put out, Good Hair talking about why from birth we're told our hair is bad hair. Nobody wants it, it's just messy, unprofessional. And growing up here, I haven't had my hair done probably since I was 18 years old. There's nobody here that does my kind of hair and I don't trust them. I've, I've gone to a few places and I asked them, have you, do you, have you done ethnic hair? They say yes. And I'm like, I'm not Mexican. <laughs> have you done like my kind of hair? And they say yes, and I'm like, well, how many have you done? Oh, well, I did it in school. So you don't do it. If you look at the black community, at least, this, and again, this is not my experience, but based on media and books, there's this culture around going to salons and barbershops. I don't have it. It doesn't exist here. There's, I mean, I don't know what I would get out of going to something like that, but I get the impression that in the black communities, this is a large part of it. So I just went, I let my hair go natural years ago. And I am absolutely certain I have lost jobs over it because women, especially women, don't consider it nat professional. They think it's messy and I just do not care anymore. <laughs> Cause this, this is, this is the, this is the hair God gave me. And I'm not, um, I, I gave up on doing that sort of thing a long time ago. I was always a pretty good student, actually a really good student, and then things started sliding a little bit in junior high, or when I was a junior, and, and going into a senior. And the number one thing that kept me getting up every day is I love music. I mean, it's almost always the first thing schools cut, but when I didn't want to go to school, when I didn't do any, want to do any schoolwork, I wanted to play. So, and I even got up early for chat. And anyone who knows me for a long time, I do not like getting up in the morning. I got up early to play jazz. And Susan Foster was our band director. And um, at some point I became the eldest trombone person. <laughs> and she pushed me for solos. I hate being in front of people. So coming out of high school, things started falling apart. I was depressed. I was fighting a lot with my siblings and my parents and I was starting to realize that I was black and I was kind of mad about it. Um, I spent most of my life not being able to talk about it. Like I bet the word racism never came up in most of my household because nobody wanted to touch that topic and I think they maybe thought 
it would cause problems or make people uncomfortable. It's just almost everyone I grew up with just never bothered to ask what the experience was. And so I was going through all of that when I told my parents I didn't want to go to college. I wanted to take a year off, just kind of breathe or, or do something before I push myself. And what Ashlyn did is they got my counselor, which I think his name was Rodney at the time, and the principal and another teacher and my parents. So I had five people sitting around the table telling me why I had to go. And if I didn't go, I'd ruin my life and I'd never go again. But it's all these statistics that say, if you don't go straight out of college or straight out of high school to college, you're just not gonna do it. So I actually wound up getting scholarships to like, I think it was Pacific Lutheran up in Washington. And um, they did the whole brag thing where they said I got like $2,500 in scholarship money um, and something else. And then I got my award letter, a 17, I think it was $17,000 short. I mean, I could do math. <laughs> I graduated high school and I didn't understand what I was supposed to do with that. So because I was so depressed and my parents, I'm a first generation college grad, they didn't know. So I just kind of slept in bed every day, didn't do anything. Um, just thinking that I don't know what you're supposed to do when you have this shortfall because it doesn't tell you. And so I called up to, to sign up for my classes. And I think I was trying to pick like, I think they had like a black history, whatever, choice. But I'd, I'd waited so long that the classes were full, so they were putting me in a bunch of classes I didn't want. And I finally told my parents I'm not going. So I never did go to that, to that school. My twin went to U of O. And she was up there doing relatively well. And so I worked at Harry and David for a little while. I think I was, back then it was like the catalog. You would process the catalog orders where they mailed them in. And it was like graveyard shift or something. And I did that for a little while. And then I joined her at U of O. And U of O, and we shared a dorm. I mean, it just felt more comfortable because she's there. I mean, she's my twin. It's like having your best friend connected to you forever, basically. And it was at U of O where I was the first time I was, I can't even, I was walking around campus and I don't remember his name because we never stayed in contact, but a, a, a black man yelled at me, sister. He's like, hey, sister. And I had no idea he was talking to me because no one had ever referred to me as a sister before. I mean, not outside my immediate family. And when I didn't respond, he said it again. And then he came over and started talking to me. Um, and then I wound up joining a Black Women's Achievement student union group there. Um, but I still hadn't actually recovered from this, this anger, this resentment thing that was going on. And I didn't, I didn't do real well at U of O. Um, I withdrew before everything fell apart so my grades wouldn't go down. And then I ran into Lily Parker, who is, um, she's a, she's a, she was an, she was an advisor. 50, she went back to school at 55 years old and became an advisor at U of O. And she was, so she is, <laughs> she was a black woman. <laughs> and I was just kind of floundering. And she brings me into this room and she shows me this picture of Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, and Mandela. I knew who one of those people were because they don't teach you that in school. They don't think it's important. And she just started opening up to me. Um, she, she wanted to keep me in school if she could, but she cared more about like how I felt, how I was handling things. And we had discussions about Black Women of Achievement Group because they were nice ladies, but they would say some things like inviting mixes to parties and stuff. Mixes is me, biracial. Um, I, have, I call myself a biracial. I don't like the term mix because we use that with dogs. <laughs> But um, there's, there's not a right term to describe people who are not all of one thing. We're still trying to figure that out as a country and as a, as a world, really. Um, and I told her how some of those things made me uncomfortable. Um, and we just had these long conversations. And she's like, well, they're not saying that to be racist. They're saying that 
because they're black. And I was like, it feels, it feels similar. But it was never quite as bad as what I ran into in here, in Southern Oregon. Um, but this is just kind of a long story to say that I struggled for a long time for a lot of reasons at U of O. Then I had to move home because no money, no work, went back home, went to Harry and David again. Um, just the seasonal work year after year until the point where when I tried to get full-time work, I was punished because of the gaps in these seasonal works. And they're like, well, you didn't work for three months. I'm like, well, Harry and David doesn't hire most people for permanent. So it's like, I didn't do anything wrong. But they're like, there's too many gaps. Um, and then at one point, my twin suggested that I look at SOU because you know that's where she went to. And I was like, they're not going to give me financial aid. I screwed up everything at U of O. And then while well, working at Harry and David, um, I went to financial aid office to um, a lady named, um, I think it was Peggy Nistosis. And she sat down with me and she's like, here's what we can do with your financial aid. She's like, we can't, you won't get enough money to live on because at this point I'm living on my own. But we can, we can get you into one class once a week and you can continue working. And that's what I did. My dad gave me like $400 or something for books because I didn't have money for books. <laughs> I mean, I'm working an almost a minimum wage job at Harry and David. Once a week, like Wednesdays at the, at the time they didn't have the RCC SOU building. So it was like with the job council building that on Market Street, that's where they're having the evening classes. And I started with one class a week. And I had to beg my supervisor for those tests because for reasons that make no sense to me, you have all these nice schedules that work, that work with work and they work with school. And then when they put out the finals, they don't care. <laughs> you're, you're, and if you could lose your job for, for not showing up. So I, I just let them know long in advance the weeks of the finals. And I'm like, please just let, I don't know what day yet because they don't, I don't really release the final test days. And I'm like, I just need the one, you know, even just a few hours to, to take the test. And then um, I, I did that for a little while. So that was like, it's not even a part-time, it's like a, no, it's a part-time student. So that was the one class. Then I went to half-time at some point, got hired by US Cellular. They closed the call center the day that we graduated in our training. That was probably made the news for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and at that point, I finally went full-time. So by the time I was full-time at SOU, um, I was a non-traditional student. Barely. Like the age group, just barely. <laughs> and what that meant was, um, it was just a different experience. I never really had the full college party, whatever student. It was just different. Um, and so then I, gradu I graduated from there with an offer at Asante. And I finally thought, you know, I made it. I'm in decision support. I'm doing reports. I'm doing this critical thinking thing. I'm making more money than I could ever imagine. And then I get laid off six months later because we hit a massive recession. Um, and so I'm unemployed for almost 99 weeks, which is the extent, because they extended it to two years, trying to keep people from Basically, we had nothing. Um, and I'm still having this problem because I have these seasonal gaps. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Your, your time at SOU. Mm -hmm. um, so you really worked towards getting full time because you saw that as an opportunity and, and an avenue. What, what about being black at SOU? What about being biracial at SOU? You know, I remember working. I was. I had very little social life because I'm a non-traditional student mostly. Like non-traditional enough where they didn't, I didn't have to chase my parents down for like tax returns anymore. They were always late. Didn't matter that I needed it for financial aid. Like just constantly could never give me anything. And, they're, and they are constantly self-employed, which made it just a huge mess. So I think it was like a 25 or something. You don't have to ask them anymore. So when I went back, finally, I didn't have to like wait and beg and whatever. So I'm a non-traditional student. I'm working full time. Um, and I and I just didn't have much of a social life. I did clash a lot with us different SOU students. Um, I remember 
going into, they put up this, I want to call it a green tax, a green fee, something to help SOU get off of traditional energy. And they're trying to get me to sign a petition in the middle of class. So it's not like where you're out in the courtyard and you know could just bypass them or talk to them. It's in the middle of class, you're a captive audience. And I basically said no. My, my, I had scholarships at one point. I actually got a diversity scholarship. My scholarship does not cover fees. So all these fees they tack on comes directly from me and I can barely afford it. I'm, li I'm living in a mobile home park because I can't afford to live anywhere. And if you live too far out, they, they try to push you to get on dorms or whatever. So I'm just, I'm just living in the same mobile home park that burned this year. Um, and I'm telling them, no, I, for, for those of us who are, who are just struggling to make it, we can't afford these $15, $20, $30 fees that keep tack, they keep tacking on. And she looks me straight in the eye and she says, buy one less CD. And I'm like, I don't buy CDs. I can't afford those either. And so my engagement with SOU didn't improve over time. It got less because the relationship with these, I understand why they want to do it, but the people that struggle, I don't think they understand. The technology fees, the green fees, even if it's a good cause. The, the students that were pushing these, they just had no concept of you know going to, to WinCo and, you know, pulling out your $20 and like counting it so that when you come up, you, you're, I mean, you're counting in your head the entire time. This is what I have. You don't just put out another dollar. This is your budget. And, and then they're just like, well, we're just going to add a $15 fee on there. You should have no problem with this. Stop buying your CDs. And I'm like, well, that, first of all, traditional, <coughs> for the first year students, they don't really like the first, like when your parents haven't gone to college, my family constantly said, asked why I wasn't doing more. <laughs> like you're going to college, how come, how come you're not working more or whatever? They don't understand that like two hours in class is like four hours studying or something in order to do well. I mean, you could do less and maybe not achieve as well, but um, just that whole idea, you're struggling with people who don't understand what you're doing. You're struggling with things at work. Um, I remember I got, I hated group projects, despised them. And every professor's out there sitting there thinking like, well, I'm going to have a group project. This is going to do something because they're going to work that, you know, going to have to, because you have to work group projects at work. I understand that. But every time I had a group project, the same conversation always came up. Well, I don't want to do anything on the weekdays, so we'll just wait on the week or, you know, something like that. I'm like, I work. So if you guys want me to contribute anything with this, these are the days that we meet. <laughs> I mean, it was, and that's more of a non-traditional thing. SOU, I graduate, get hired by Asante, um, get laid off very shortly after, do the unemployment thing for almost 99 weeks. Um, by now, because of the Harry and David off and on seasons, a very short time at Asante, nobody in the valley would touch me. They're basically saying, I'm not a good employee. Chase automatically rejected my application and I hadn't even submitted it. <laughs> like they, I guess they were scrubbing pre-applications and they just saw the, 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 the multiple years and I kept trying to tell them like, yeah, but there's only been one job since I had my degree. And it was during like the worst recession ever and nobody would give me a time of day. And my sister's telling me, you know, this might be a chance to leave the valley. And a lot of people do, we can't stay here. There's the jobs aren't here. A lot of people who live here, locals have to leave and then try and come back. But of course, at this point, I'm thinking, I'm just gonna leave and why would I come back? <laughs> I mean, if it works out in New Jersey, I guess that'll be it. Um, but at some point, I do decide, okay, so I'm on unemployment. My biggest problem now is nobody trusts that I can actually be a good worker because of all these odd jobs over the years. And none of them are in the actual field that I'm interested in. So AmeriCorps puts up um, these volunteer positions 
and one of them is with the Job Council. Um, I don't know anything about AmeriCorps. I've heard a little bit about Peace Corps, but at this point I have no idea. So I start looking into AmeriCorps, um, because even when you have no money, <laughs> just barely, because my unemployment was not good. I mean, my last, it wasn't even a full year on my last job, so I'm just kind of holding on to what little money I have, making very little, but I still have internet. And I'm playing games, because that's my social thing, but I'm not usually enjoying it, because I'm so depressed. And Job Council basically talks about um, needing a volunteer to work with their youth. This is, I call them troubled youth. People who didn't finish high school, most of them, or have some other thing that's kind of getting in their way. So I apply. And I go to the job council, and I think I'd use the job council maybe once or twice to put my resume together. And I have this conversation with Tiffany Grimes, um, who's in charge of the, the youth program there. And they have a lot of questions for me. And it's like the most realistic interview I've ever had. I mean, I feel like I, I want this and I could do it. But, um, and there is probably some desperation on my part, but I'm also thinking like, this could have been me. There were several parts during my journey where I could have wound up as a teenage girl who was pregnant, or someone who got into drugs, or all these other things that could have led me into this troubled youth description. And I think I could do it. <laughs> and I'm all worried about it too. Um, even after I do the interviews and I'm kind of high on the list. Also, they just don't get people with economics, business degrees, that sort of thing. And I'm thinking, you know, a year of doing something will look good on the resume. And also, it's absolutely true. I come from a family who's not educated, who also didn't have a lot of money, struggled. And there's just so many places where I could have been in this position where I don't even have a high school degree or something is just kind of getting in the way. And then they offer it and I accept it. And I just keep, I keep one thing in my head this entire time. You gotta, you gotta get through this because um, one thing she did tell me is once they get a volunteer, if that volunteer doesn't work out, they don't get another one. Like this is the spot they need filled. Um, and so I worked with Youth Build and I worked with, uh, um, it was like kind of a clinical healthcare. There's like two parts to it, kind of construction and then the healthcare piece. This program is largely run by women. Um, and I had never encountered that before either. Uh, there, were, there, there were men too, the, the two construction guys, they're, they're great. Um, and then, uh, oh shoot, I just lost his name. He was the teacher. Oh my gosh, I can picture him too. He's on my Facebook. Um, Kelvin? No, no, that's not right. Anyways, but Tiffany is running it. Dawn is there. Um, the forestry program that they also have, it's a woman, they go out to the woods and just, I don't know, really know what they did, but I mean, there's just all these women in charge of these stuff and they're intelligent and it's just, I never, even, even in decision support, I got the, dis, kind of a traditional gentleman manager. And this is the first time that it's, and it's not traditional. Tiffany is very, um, she's still in the area. She lives in Jacksonville. She's very, uh. It, it broke me out of my shell to some extent because at this point had had the unemployment thing not happened and um, the AmeriCorps thing not happened, I could have turned into a very judgmental person, hugely, um, because one of the problems with going through a lot of struggles and then coming out of them is, is judging people who don't do that. <laughs> um, and, and that, I could almost feel myself going that way because I, you know, I got a great job at Asante. I'm making more money than I could ever dream of. It's certainly not something most of my family's experienced with. And you could almost forget all that path it took to get there. And then slam, unemployment. Nobody will even look at my application. <laughs> and then here I am in the AmeriCorps program with the Job Council and I'm like, and at this point I have very little confidence. But then they start doing things like filling out resumes. I'm like, what do I know about resumes? Well, I know that's not right. <laughs> 
so you know help them fix that or what are you helping them prep interviews and I'm like what do I know about interviews I can't even get it and then I'm like oh yeah nope <laughs> and then I start realizing that there are things that I do know even if it's not on a piece of paper these soft skills this this e critical thinking is not written on there but it's like I didn't get this far without doing it at one point um, they had a word they had a word in Excel teacher that actually um, she does both the adult and the youth program and something happened and they were overlapping and the adult they didn't have someone to do word or excel and so i was like well what do they teach them and they're like what do you mean i'm like well i, I know word and excel <laughs> but i don't i don't really know how to teach and and then they, she basically just handed me her lesson plans and i just kind of rolled into teaching them word and stuff and and it was it was more than that too it's like I had to teach them like we had a couple students that would just put their bags on their chair and then go out and smoke and then they would try and explain to me why they were on time it's like your bag is not your body you're not on time if you're not <laughs> the clock turns and you're not here like this does not work so these life skills that I uh, evidently developed, I wasn't very good at them in the beginning, but I was actually part of that and the job council helped me teach that. And the other thing was, huge thing, is Ashlyn, they don't really teach it in high school, Ashlyn has this perception that they teach inclusion and diversity especially around the LGBTQTA plus group. I never, I knew that there was a presence there. It was never taught to me. Not in a way that you would actually mean it. I mean, I mean the parades were inclusive, but it wasn't until we actually had a transgender individual in that youth group that I actually understood the need <laughs> the struggles, where the pain points are, how so much of the system isn't designed for this. <laughs> and just watch one of our students just encounter the most unfortunate things and it just seems so pointless. Like these are fixable things if only society would do it. So my position on that group was almost wholly formed in a complete and wholesome way by my AmeriCorps experience. Um, because it, it can be easy to forget that other people have struggles. <laughs> and I was, I was angry for a long time because I don't feel like I was ever allowed to be black. I was black, but I wasn't allowed to be black. And so that anger and resentment lasted for quite a while. And it's also one of the reasons I didn't really identify with the woman part nearly as much because the other one was overwhelming. Like, what difference does it make when I'm a double minority? And as far as I could see, the second part of that minority has it way better off than the other part. Um, and then I encounter this transgender individual and, and, and just different members from that group. And I start realizing that the groups are coming together that some of the needs overlap. They're not the same. There's different needs, different issues, but seeing someone else struggle with that made me realize that the struggles can be similar. Some of the employees are also part of this group and I'm learning from them. Still don't really have that racial part, but now I'm, I'm getting, these are feminists. <laughs> these women are. Um, and I'm starting to hear a different version of what that word actually means. Um, growing up, feminism was a negative thing. You didn't want to be a feminist because that just means you're a, frankly, you're a bitch. <laughs> and, and you don't like men and men don't like you. And it just didn't sound like um, something that you wanted to be a part of. And then at AmeriCorps, almost more than half the people I'm working with in charge are women. And that's just not something I had experienced before. And not only that, they're open. We're talking about 
they know about my struggles. They know about, I mean, and this is probably true for some cultures where you just, you don't talk about these things at work. You don't share, you don't overlap. I mean, but these are like, they're a combination of like coworkers and mentors and they have different skill sets than me. Um, we did that whole uh, Myers-Briggs personality thing. They always encouraged me to try and do things along with the students. Um, I was a volunteer, but they're also, they're trying to grow the students and it became evident they were trying to grow me too. Um, they have a little more resistance with me because I'm not one of their students, so they can't like, you know, <laughs> use the same tools they do to guide my behavior. Um, they tried to get me to drive a bus once and I was like, oh no, you're lucky I'm driving this big old van. I'm not getting in this, absolutely not. There's nothing they were gonna say to change my mind on that. <laughs> but um, the Myers-Briggs thing, and then that's where I realized certain personality types were shining and why some of my stage fright actually kind of makes a little sense and why like Tiffany was, I can't remember the exact words, but she can be in charge of an army, like in front of a ton of people guiding them and stuff. And then there's this kind of this, this middle group which, where they're good with like 20 or 30 people or whatever. And there were two of us where we're, we shine one-on-one. -on -one. You could put me in a room with a student that is struggling with math, with reading or something, and I could be in there for hours. It will not destroy me. <laughs> um, just the one-on-one, -on -one aspect I can't they had a name for it um, is why I could actually sit down and just communicate with people usually pretty openly and not feel drained from that experience you put me in front of 50 people and I get frustrated I can still do it but I am it is draining my energy to be in charge of groups like that but it's not impossible and that's also where I learned like I have a tendency to be a leader, but not a requirement, which is why I can follow somebody who leads and will take over if I feel that leadership is failing, but I don't have a need to lead all the time, but I am a leader. So it's this is kind of this personality thing that they're getting to. And so through this exploration of, you know, with the students, along with the students and talking with largely these women, because the, the, um, the guys in the construction group, they're out at the build site all the time and I'm not always there. I spend, I spent more time with the other groups, but um, I'm just kind of learning more about myself. And like I said, these women, I think most of them could call, call themselves feminists. And that was not, um, I'm pretty sure it's especially the one, but that was not, like that was a positive view. <laughs> it wasn't, you know, old school. And I say that not to be like disrespectful, but the idea of burning bras, um, running around naked in parades or something, it's just not something that I think the current generation like myself can really I mean, we know what it is, and we know that it's important, but we don't really link to it. Um, and the man-hating and the men hating you, that was easy to link to. That's, I think that's where the problem was. Like, this is easy to understand and you don't want it. This is still, this is still foreign and it's probably not going to happen um, again. And then just kind of seeing these groups come together and, and then not just being told, like, this is diverse, actually being in it. Um, again, the racial diversity wasn't there largely because of where we live, but actually seeing people say we're, we're diverse and then actually, you know, showing that was, was just different. <laughs> and so at some point, and I don't know that there was a specific point, but I know AmeriCorps is, and Job Council was a large part of it. Um, being... I wouldn't call it active because I didn't really get active until recently. Um, just the consideration of other groups, the consideration of um, cementing where I fall <laughs> when it comes to caring about other people, which is basically I do. And where I, where I sit when it comes to quality, which I absolutely believe in. I believe that it needs to happen. I don't believe that it is happening. Um, and it's that equality part that kind of 
drew me out, especially, so I have a degree in economics and I work in IT. These are not areas that either women or minorities are, are especially represented in. But I have seen very strong women in those areas. So it became a little bit easier to link to other women. Um, when I started working at UCLA, I started encountering other races. I don't see them on a daily basis, but they are there. And I've had some long conversations with some of them um, about my experience here. And then I, I hit another group, another black woman, which is also a double minority like me. So I start, I don't know, just start linking the two. Um, the, other, the other issue is that came negative with feminism was the term white feminism. I don't actually know when I first encountered that term and understood what it meant. I suspect it was somewhere in college. Um, and the struggle there is we just celebrated a hundred years of women being able to vote, but not all women. And that struggle still remains because I want to celebrate, but I don't have the privilege or opportunity to forget the other woman part because I am well aware when someone like me actually began to be able to vote. And it didn't come with just a law. There was several years of violence and turmoil that made the, actually enforcing that law very difficult. Um, so, <laughs> um, I guess where I'm getting at is at this point in my life, I have a lot to consider anytime I take a position on something, but I feel like, I feel like I can do both and I'm not avoiding it anymore. So. For a while, I was avoiding certain, it's like I didn't want to get involved, I didn't have time. Um, the Women's March was probably one of the times when I realized that people around me were engaged in some level. I, I did not participate in the Women's March, but I know several people who did. And their excitement around it and their concerns about it. Um, I have friends from the LBGQTA plus community that had some concerns about it. The black community had some concerns about it. And um, it's, it's hard because when you live in an area where you don't really have a group that you can easily talk this about, <laughs> because it's like, okay, so the women's organization that was in charge of the women's marches, they had a lot of accusations about what was going on in terms of race and the other groups. And you don't really know how that's playing out because social media isn't the great, the best place for it. Um, but at the same time, the messages are almost right, like close. I don't expect perfection, but the messages are, are close to right. And um, I'm new to the AA. UW Medford group, Carol, which is a neighbor, um, invited me, and I don't really know how to describe it other than they're a lot older than me. <laughs> I'm not sure if there's someone, there might be one person who's younger than me, but their perspective and their description of things are, are interesting. Um, and I want to, and I say interesting, although I think I want to say more like honest. And I think that's where part of my resistance to getting involved with any of these groups for years had ever been. With the Black Women of Achievement, when they were talking about inviting mixes to parties, like even feeling the need to say that and trying to talk about it, it felt like you couldn't be honest and say, I mean, yeah, this makes me uncomfortable because I'm one of the people you're talking about. <laughs> and just not getting anyone to actually be honest that this is happening. Same with, with all the Ashland stuff, like, like 
keep saying how diverse you are when the KKK is burned into Medford's lawn and trying to claim, well, that's not happening in Ashland. Ashland is not inclusive. <laughs> it is simply not. It ignores. Like, ignoring problems does not make it inclusive. It's just simply not. I grew up there. The inclusive, it's, it's not there. I don't know why anyone thinks the diversity is barely there, but the inclusive definitely isn't there. It's just, if it's happening in Medford, it's happening in Ashland. We do not have hard borders in this valley. If there's a problem, when I, when I go shopping and someone looks me in the eye and asks the person behind me if they need help, that is not a problem that I experience only in Medford. It happens where often when I go shopping in the valley. I do not do most of my shopping in the valley. It I is not. I understand what, what you mean by that. Was the person older than you in back? Of she was or? white and she was behind me. Okay. So I had a person look me directly in the eye. I was next in line and she asked the person behind me if she could have, be, if she could assist her. This happens to me all the time in the valley. And for a long time, friends and family didn't really believe it, but some of them have actually seen it. And now they know. <laughs> but that's not, it's not exclusive to a particular part of the valley. Um, it's, it's one of the reasons why I shop online. I do not get deals in this area, um, not with cars, not with furniture. They will not negotiate with me. It's, I'll be, I could spend 30 minutes in the store and I probably won't even be approached and offered anything. Um, the, the woman, Lily Parker, who from U of O, the academic advisor, she visited Ashland once, couldn't get, even, couldn't get service at one of the restaurants. She, she'd been here once and she knows what I'm talking about. Um, and, that, and I mean, that's the reason why feminism has often taken a second place in my particular perspective in life because the other one is prominent. Not by choice, it's just, it, I just encounter it more. I have no idea if someone treats me like garbage, if it's because I'm a woman or it's because I'm black or biracial. Do you think it's conscious or unconscious? Do you think it's deliberate and malicious or ignorance? I think it's mostly deliberate, but they are probably ignorant of how, how bad it is. <laughs> um, you, you, is it more than microaggression, or is this what 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 you're describing? Is this what you would call microaggressions? Um, or are those even smaller and more insidious? It's hard to say, because, for example, when I worked at Sante, you could say something, be completely ignored. And then someone else would say something. It's the best thing since sliced bread. The, I the can't tell you how many women have said that. Exact and that situation. Yeah, and what I learned at Asante though is it was happening to other women because these women became my friends. Yeah. So I'm I I have shifted belief that I believe that's a woman thing. Um, I do not know if it's worse for biracial women because they're doing it to all women. It could very well be. <laughs> <laughs> but there aren't enough biracial women there to really to know. But um, that is a huge problem in IT, and it, it it does happen in the in the healthcare industry too. I mean, the healthcare industry has a lot of women, but in certain departments and stuff, you just don't see them in leadership positions. Do you, do you think so? I think privilege has its own um, confidence. Yes. Its own assumption. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> do you do you think women eat other? Do you think women eat their girls? Do you know what I mean? Yes, some of the worst, especially when it comes to like women against other women. Yeah, yeah, yeah I do, and I and I don't really. I'm guessing we don't really have it, like like the hair thing. I suspect it's more women that are telling black women that natural hair is not professional. And then not just black women, I think it's more women because they're also the ones that complain about clothes um, more. I, 
guys can certainly notice these things. I just don't, I just find it hard to believe they care. Um, a lot of them. I mean, are they really going to notice the difference between one skirt and another? And they're going to like complain about it? I think that's more of a women thing. And, and, and it's, it's almost an impossibility too, because we see this with our politicians. Like we're taught not to toot our own horn. But then if we don't toot it enough, we're not assertive enough. But if we're too assertive, then we're just angry. And like, I am who I am. It's, I don't, it's not, it's not a, it wasn't a personal choice. <laughs> like I was born the way that I am and I engage things in similar ways as others. And sometimes I experience different things, but it doesn't stop. I mean, it just, it's just, it's not something you just turn off. So my, if I hear the word colorblind or I don't see color again, it's gonna flip my lid. <laughs> that is like one of the worst things you can ever say to a person. My vision of the future isn't that anyone's colorblind because no matter who says that, it's simply not true. It's that it's not the prominent thing on a young girl's mind that someone might tell her when she's nine year olds what coding actually is. I could have easily gone that route. Um, had I actually understood what, I really thought it was just someone over there typing zeros and ones for hours a day. <laughs> it sounded horrible. And then I learned later that that's like machine language and what the programmers do are using programs close to what I use now. No one ever bothered to tell me that. Um, Hidden figures. I didn't even know that black women were involved in the NASA program. No one told me that. I didn't know who Mel Nelson Mandela was. Um, people describe Malcolm X as just some sort of terrorist, which is a complete gross oversimplification of what happened. I didn't understand the Black Panthers were actually a political party. <laughs> I mean, and, and they weren't just, it wasn't just black people in the Black Panthers. It was, I mean, there's just things that we don't, we don't get taught. And so you don't know, and they assume that your families tell you, but um, somewhere out there is a young person of a black family getting the talk. And the talk in the black community is basically what to do not to get killed by police. And there's an assumption that we all get to talk. Well, I'm, I, wasn't, I wasn't raised in a, in a black family, I was raised in a white family didn't get the talk. And I'm not sure if black women get the talk or if it's mostly black men. It seems like it's mostly black men. So I don't have a direct connection to the black community. <laughs> it's getting stronger now as I reach out to more people. Um, and the same with the women. Um, my, my experience in IT has led me to some very strong and um, open women because that's what it takes to get into IT. I, and it's unfortunate because I think, I think women who are not, like if they try to avoid confrontation, I don't see how well they're gonna do in these fields. And I don't think that's right. So there is nothing that says that you <laughs> need to constantly do battles in order to program or in order to work in IT. It's just something we have to encounter right now because of the way the systems are made. Um, the future doesn't have to look that way. If someone is quiet and they're shy and they want to be involved in something because they love it, there should be nothing that stops them because there is nothing about sitting at a computer and helping people and learning systems that requires the confrontation that a lot of us encounter now. And we do, we have to push our views and we have to push credit, to get credit for the work that we do. Um, I'm hoping that in the future that's not the case. <laughs> because if you love video games, if you just love working with people, there's, in medicine, you, the providers are constantly on systems. <laughs> I mean, computer systems are not something you avoid. Um, there's just no reason, and I think we lose a lot of women in interest because one, they don't see themselves in the most prominent things that use computer-generated graphics, video games. You just don't see um, the variety there. 
there's people in charge that they don't always show the women that are behind it. <laughs> I mean, you just need to be more visual. Um, if I walked into elementary school or high school now and tried to describe what I do, I, I don't know that I'd do it very well because there's no foundation for it. Like, who, t who tells you how to tell other people you can do it? That this would be something you'd enjoy. I do not think it is approved as much as people say it is. Um, but I, I feel like my contribution beyond just, you know, the daily stuff is probably why I'm in front of this camera right now, even though I hate cameras, is, is sharing. Um, because I think there's so many points where people tell you no or it can't happen and they're wrong. <laughs> and it's not because things are better than they, sh they are. It's not because they're where they need to be. It's because um, every single day we are making decisions on what the future is gonna look like. And I do not know whether or not I'm gonna have a large impact on anybody. But I do know that when I go somewhere and when I'm in a classroom, when I'm at work, when I'm in a meeting, it is very rare for someone not to know that Tanya's there because I do not allow that. Whether they like it or not, I am not invisible. <laughs> and I think a lot of attempts have been made to, to soften that over the years. And anytime that comes up, my first thought is if I allowed that criticism to stop me, I would not be here to, today. Um, Yeah, that's where I am today because, yeah.